Coming up on Network Africa. Attack on Khartoum weapons store causes fire as armed conflict enters sixth day. Red Cross official says volunteers struggling to reach civilians as fighting continues in Sudan. Two residents pack their bags racing against time to celebrate the end of Ramadan fasting in faraway states. Hello and welcome to Network Africa on Channels Television. I'm Anne Mwawadu. Let's start in Sudan where things are further heating up. As a huge fire erupted in the building in the capital Khartoum, hours after warring parties announced another ceasefire that seems to have collapsed. Reports say the fire spread after an attack on a weapons store. A civilian activist group, the Khartoum Resistance Committee, posted footage of the fire on Twitter saying that it has spread from Mohammed Weapons Shop in Khartoum 2 area. All the families trapped in the building near the fire have been evacuated, but it's still not clear who evacuated them. The Sudanese military and the paramilitary rapid support forces, the RSF, had agreed to a 24-hour humanitarian ceasefire on Tuesday, but the troops collapsed within minutes of its proposed launch at 6 p.m. local time. A new ceasefire with the same timing was put forward by the RSF on Wednesday, with the army saying that it would abide by the truce, but gunfire could still be heard across the capital, and clashes are still being reported in several locations around the city. Many of Sudan's best hospitals are concentrated in central Khartoum, where the most of the fighting have been intense between the paramilitary and the army, and the forces are taking place requiring doctors and even patients to brave gunfire and bombardment. But most hospitals have closed shops, and many wonder if the already failing Sudan health system can survive the raging armed conflict. The few hospitals still operating in Khartoum after Sudan's sudden explosion into war have bodies lying unburied, bullets crashing through windows and terrified medics staying away as artillery pounds nearby. Doctors and hospital staff describe harrowing conditions with no water for cleaning, little electricity for life-saving equipment and food running out, forcing them to send sick patients home and turn away the injured. At a care centre in Khartoum for children with cancer, treatment has been paused with the generator lying idle. The young children queue to pick up trays of soup, rice and watermelon. According to the Sudanese Doctors' Union, in over four days of fighting, nine hospitals in Sudan have been hit by artillery and 16 forcibly evacuated, with none still providing a full service inside the capital. World Health Organization's regional health, Hamid Al-Mandari, said medics were facing real danger. <laughs> There are 16 hospitals in Khartoum and other states, including Darfur, for example, are almost getting out of service because of the exhaustion of the medical teams and the lack of supplies. In addition, we are also extremely concerned about reports of armed attacks against health institutions, kidnapping ambulances while transporting patients with the medics inside. Health institutions are looted and occupied by armed personnel. Sudan's health ministry estimates that at least 270 people have died since the violence erupted at the weekend, while for the more than 2,600 people injured in the fighting, as well as the many others already needing treatment, the rapid collapse of the healthcare system spells disaster. Aid workers are struggling to reach Sudanese civilians in dire need of supplies as heavy combat rages near populated residential areas. And that's according to the Red Cross representative in the region, Aliona Sikenko, who says the circumstances are already worsening for households and civilians in the city. For the Red Cross and other humanitarian organizations, the delivery of much needed supply like food and water and even medicines to the city's civilians is crucial. But the ongoing violence has made that mission nearly impossible to achieve safely. 
right now our teams uh, that are in Khartoum in the capital and also in uh, some other parts of the country that are affected by the fighting, they're simply unable to move because there's heavy shelling, there are heavy combats. We have uh, had some sharp nail and bullets also entering our offices. So it is an extremely difficult situation and we have to balance the um, we need to be able to do our work to reach uh, the wounded, to collect the dead bodies, but we also need to think about the safety of our own staff. This is the reason why we have been continuously calling for, uh, calling on all parties to provide the necessary humanitarian space to allow ourselves, um, the, but also uh, Sudanese Red Crescent volunteers and uh, medical workers to reach people in need and to also to provide the necessary respite for civilians because you have so many people who are trapped uh, in their homes or trapped in other places like airports, supermarkets, uh, schools, uh, hospitals, and they're running out of water, they are running out of food, and this humanitarian situation is just becoming untenable. There already was a humanitarian crisis before this fighting started. If you look at all the humanitarian indicators, they are, they are blinking red. If you look, there are like almost 10 million people who don't have enough to eat. Uh, three million displaced people, more than one million refugees. Uh, the uh, economic crisis and the skyrocketing food price, prices were affecting these vulnerable communities more than the rest of the people. Chad's Defense Minister Daoud Yahya Ibrahim says the army stopped and disarmed the Sudanese contingent of 320 soldiers who entered the West African country on Monday. Mr. Ibrahim told a press conference that the confrontation between the Sudanese might create new waves of refugees and adds that maintaining security will become very difficult. Chad's government closed its border with Sudan on Saturday and even called for calm amid an apparent coup attempt in Khartoum by Sudan's main military group. The West African country's defense minister said the country had hosted more than 400,000 Sudanese refugees in the past. While well, Kenyan President William Ruto has been asking the immediate cessation of hostilities in Sudan, President Ruto feels the escalation in the conflict risks drawing in actors from Sudan's neighbors and equal play into competition between Russia and the United States for regional influence. The deteriorating situation in Sudan is of great concern to our region and continent. In the last five days, fighting has led to the loss of hundreds of lives, massive destruction of property, and displacement of civilians. Kenya is deeply alarmed that a misunderstanding over a single outstanding item in the political framework agreement, namely the time frame for the integration of the rapid support forces into the Sudan armed forces has degenerated into violent conflict. Kenya implores the leadership of the two parties to ensure full compliance with the resolution of the Intergovernmental Authority on Development Heads of State Summit held last Sunday. This includes an immediate cessation of hostilities allowing unrestricted humanitarian access and extending full cooperation to the IGAD heads of state mission when it visits Khartoum. Well, after violence erupted at the weekend in the past struggle between the Sudanese army and the paramilitary troops known as the RSF, life as citizens knew it had changed. Several residents have fled the capital to escape the dangerous exchange of gunfire, and no one even knows when or if they will return, given the heat of the exchange. Several residents of Khartoum are seen dragging suitcases towards vans to escape the capital where clashes have continued for almost a week and electricity and water were cut. Continuous bombardments and loud blasts can be heard in central Khartoum around the compound housing the army headquarters and also at the main airport, which has been fiercely contested and put out of action since fighting erupted at the weekend. Huddled in their homes, residents of a capital, one of Africa's largest cities, struggle with power cuts and one resident, Abdul Malik, says his supermarkets were running out of food. There's no food. Supermarkets are empty. 
The situation isn't safe, honestly, so people are leaving. With no signs of peace in the city before the Eid festival that marks the end of Ramadan this week, some Khartoum residents decide to leave for states nearby where fighting has not been reported. The fighting pits military leader Burhan against RSF Chief General Mohammed Dagalo, widely known as Hamid T, following tension over a plan to integrate the RSF into the regular military. Burhan is the head of the ruling council installed after the 2021 military coup and the 2019 ouster of veteran autocrat Omar al-Bashir, while Hamid T was his deputy on the ruling council. The conflict risks drawing in actors from Sudan's neighbors and could play it a competition between Russia and the United States for regional influence. Sudan sits strategically between Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Ethiopia and Africa's volatile Sahel region. The Libyan National Army, the LNA, which is a group of armed forces loyal to again Khalifa Haftar, has denied providing support to a rival party in Sudan amid the deadly fighting going on there. Yen Fatah also heads Libyan parallel government in control of the east of the country, which is not recognized by the international community. He says the army is ready to play a mediating role between the rival parties in Sudan. The Sudan Army and the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces have been fighting for six days now in clashes that have killed at least 270 people. And still to come on Network Africa. U.S. troubled over detention of Tunisia's opposition leader, Rachid Ganucci, and we'll bring you the details of this and more. Please stay with us. Apologize for that technical glitch. Well, you're still watching Network Africa and Channels Television. Let's bring in VOA correspondent Mariama Diallo. She's speaking to us from Nairobi, Kenya. Hello, Mariama. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me again. And thank you for joining us as always. Well, we are getting the impression that civilians are not even safe in their own homes, behind closed doors. It doesn't matter if they are indoors. I mean, what is Sudan looking like as we speak? Well, I think, uh, you know, just from the last six days, uh, the things that we've seen on a day-to-day basis, uh, it's basically things have not changed. If they've changed to improve now, they've changed to the worse. I think uh, what you're seeing on the streets are some streets, for example, are empty uh, because a lot of people are hunkering down. Uh, trying to stay out of the uh, crossfire. Uh, there are other streets when you see people trying to flee, trying to, to, to go to uh, basically better neighborhoods or better areas where they feel like uh, they are safer. Uh, when they are indoors, the problem is uh, uh, when you're hunkering down, uh, the problem is that there's no water or electricity. So, you know, it's very sporadic. Even when we call people trying to interview them, we can, we can hear and sometimes talking to them and all of a sudden the line cuts off. Um, so the challenges are there, uh, obviously, on, on all, in, in all ways. You know, you're inside hunkering down, but then you can't eat, uh, you don't have water, you don't have electricity, then that pushes you to go out. Um, there are UN aid workers in there right now. I mean, we've heard humanitarian organizations saying it's been very difficult to get aid to these people. But so how are they operating? Well, I think um, the same thing. Like I talked to, uh, I think it's the spokesperson for the um, High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, I talked to him, I think, either yesterday or today. I can't even, uh, don't even know what days these days because it's been so hectic. And uh, he said it's very difficult. He confirms that uh, for their workers. Uh, I think what they try to do is hunker down as much as possible, but also try to help uh, the people who are absolutely in need, who can't uh, get to hospitals. I'll give you another example. It's not just in Hartoon that it's happening. Uh, I spoke to, I think, a Médecin Sans Frontières uh, person who was uh, working at a, helping out, their group was helping out at a hospital in North Darfur. I think the place is El Shafer. And uh, they talked about, uh, I think in that area, there are basically four hospitals. The three other hospitals were closed. There's only one hospital that's functioning. So so he explained that when they are there, they've had like 100, for example, I think nearly 185 people who checked in with injuries. There were people who died. Uh, but what you have to think about is even these people, when they're helping, let's say, in hospitals, it's not just the injured that are coming in. There are so many other people 
who have medical issues, uh, you know, like if somebody told me about, you know, people have to come and deliver, for example, when you're nine months or up, when you're pregnant and you have to deliver, you have to get to the hospital. So they're already dealing with, with, with so many different uh, components, people who have long-term health problems who are waiting for surgeries, uh, who have to get to the hospital. So it's just a lot of different uh, different issues. And I think they're trying to help as much as they can, but they're also trying uh, to be safe as well, uh, because uh, if they can't help, if they're injured as well. Marim, I remember um, earlier this week when you and I were talking about this whole Sudan problem, we, uh, there was a ceasefire made by one party. And then before then, the other party had not agreed, but eventually the party agreed to the ceasefire, which was the second ceasefire that was announced. So who broke it this time and why did that happen? I think it's a very good question because the, the issue with the ceasefires are that, I, I can't even call them ceasefires because the impression we have is that the fighting continues. So unless you have a referee that is out there and says, okay, it's 6 p.m., this is the time when the uh, the ceasefire is supposed to start, uh, let's listen who fires the who fired the uh, fires the first shot. Then you can say, okay, you violated. But then how do you even know who fires the first shot? I think that is the problem of like figuring out, I think it's on both sides. Uh, the fighting has not stopped. I think they, the, the, the word ceasefire is being thrown out there. Uh, I don't know why, uh, maybe for a few minutes, maybe for a few hours here and there. But most people that we talk to, uh, they keep telling you that they are hearing uh, the fires, they're hearing uh, gunshots, they're hearing fighting. Uh, so I think we, they need to revisit what, what the word ceasefire means and, and, and do you stop? You, you just have to stop completely uh, for at least a few hours. And that's not the impression that, that we've had uh, the past six days. There are also accusations and counter-accusations flying all over. For example, I mean, some are saying that Libya is supporting one side against another. What parties do you think both sides can listen to when it comes to dialogue or at least an agreement? in this matter? I think on the Libya accusation, we, we have to be very, very careful because I think the Libyan uh, National Army actually today uh, came out and strongly, uh, categorically um, said that, no, they are not supporting those reports that says uh, that uh, they've basically uh, uh, supply some ammunition or they've supply some uh, weapon-related uh, uh, things to uh, uh, the rapid support forces. So they came out very, very strongly today and denied it. And I think our conversation yesterday, when we talked about, we talked about the fact that th there's chaos. So when there is chaos, I think everybody will try to kind of use that chaos to, to, to kind of uh, advance wherever they want to be, whether it's the rebel groups, existing rebel groups, whether it's neighboring countries who are trying to uh, kind of position themselves with one party or the other, because at this point, nobody knows who's going to be uh, uh, ruling the country. Um, there's also alliances probably before this conflict uh, uh, came about, and maybe those alliances are kind of figuring out what to do. Uh, so I think it's it's pretty, um, you know, it's, it's just, <laughs> it changes on a day-to-day -day basis, on an hourly basis, so we just have to, to keep up, uh, keep with it. Well, people are calling this an armed conflict, but I mean, if you ask anyone, this is becoming a full-scale war. Without water, without food, without aid, people are running away. What else are we going to call this if it's not a war? Well, you and I both, I think we will agree on that. I mean, I think my biggest question is how does a, how does a country go, go into a full-fledged, I mean, I, I am going to call it that way. I don't know if somebody else is not. When you look at the images in Sudan, I mean, smoke is there, you hear the gunshots, you hear, I mean, everything that you see in there looks like a pay, a, a, a pay I'm sorry, I'm sorry, like the French is coming from, looks like a country uh, that is at war. Uh, listen, when it started, uh, basically uh, on Saturday, people uh, maybe in two days, you know, they were uh, days, maybe it's almost a week, and it's still going. So something has to happen. Can you, uh, maybe I'm actually some background noise, so I don't know if you're hearing me very well. <laughs> Sorry about 
Uh, Chad closed its borders on Saturday, Marema, when the fighting began. Are we looking at a similar treatment from Sudan's other neighbors? And if that happens, what will be the fate of the fleeing residents? Where will they be running to? I think Chad's argument is is valid. Uh, Chad's defense ministry says that they've since 2003 they've had about you know almost half a million refugees, about 400,000 uh, refugees uh, from Sudan. Uh, so you know their their um, argument is is legitimate. But I think during times of war, there are also international uh, humanitarian laws that if people are fleeing for their lives and if people are in danger, I think uh, you owe it. Whatever country is uh, uh, bordering that country that's at war has the responsibility uh, to, to find a way uh, to help those people. So if Chad starts and then all the other neighboring countries follow, because as we said yesterday, uh, every one of those countries have had their own issues. Ethiopia has had the Tigrayan issue, CAR with the rebel group, the CPC group. Um, uh, Chad, the, the, the same thing, DRC with the M23 and all the other rebel groups in that, in that country. Uh, but they can't just close their borders. I mean, if people are suffering and people are fleeing what we're seeing in Sudan, I think there is a responsibility, a moral responsibility uh, for those countries uh, to do something, uh, but right. not just close their borders. All right. Thank you very much, Maria Madialo, VOA's correspondent from Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you for your contribution on Network Africa for today. Thank you for having me. To other stories now, the U.S. government has condemned the arrest of Tunisia's opposition leader and the closure of the main opposition in Ada party headquarters. The State Department said in a statement that the arrests of opposition leaders and the banning of opposition meetings represented a troubling escalation by the Tunisian government against perceived opponents. It also adds that the government's obligation to respect freedom of expression and other human rights is larger than any individual or any political party, and it isn't essential to be a vibrant democracy and to the U.S.-Tunisia relationship. Today, a Tunisian judge ordered the imprisonment of Richard Ganucci, who is the another party leader and a prominent critic of President Kaye Said. Mr. Ganucci had been arrested and detained on Monday by Tunisian authorities. A Ukrainian Nobel Peace Prize winner has called on South Africa not to allow Russian President Vladimir Putin to attend a BRICS summit in the country in August. Alexandra Romansova, the head of an NGO that became the winner of Ukraine's first ever Peace Prize last year, has asked the South African government, quote, show us that they care. The ICC issued an arrest warrant against Mr. Putin in March, meaning that Pretoria, due to host the Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa bloc summit this year, would have to detain him on arrival. The International Criminal Court warrant against Mr. Putin stems from accusations that Russia unlawfully deported Ukrainian children. Roman Sova, who is the director, executive director of Kiev-based Center for Civil Liberties, CCL, has suggested the Russian president could attend the BRICS summit via Zoom or send a minister who is not wanted by the ICC. South Africa has refused to condemn the invasion of Ukraine, which has largely isolated Moscow on the international stage, saying that it wants to stay neutral and prefers dialogue to end the war. And that's Network Africa for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu.